from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Venezuela's Defense Minister Vladimir Padrino López is reaffirming the military support for Nicolás Maduro as president, a day after the U.S. supported an attempted coup. The defense minister expressed what he called the military's unbreakable position in an address a short while ago. Where some sectors are engaging, indulging in political, infantile political behavior and damaging the destiny of our country. And we have to express our unbreakable position our commitment to a united Venezuela, to a Venezuela of virtues, of historic values, the values of our liberators, and to this social contract, this social link that Rousseau talked about, which we have expressed through a constituent process, which the people approved, which they voted for in a universal, direct, secret ballot, in a referendum, to lead the political, economic and social destiny of Venezuela. Commanders of all the regions of the Venezuelan Armed Forces said their support for Nicolás Maduro's elected government has not wavered. They say they will continue to respect the country's constitution and the rule of law. They also rejected any actions that go against the will of the people. And concerning international support, Russia, China and the United Nations Secretary General have all continued to recognize the elected government in Venezuela and they call for dialogue to resolve the confrontation in the country. On Wednesday, President Nicolás Maduro told supporters he was breaking off diplomatic relations with the United States. This, as Washington and a number of its allies said they would recognize opposition member Juan Guaidó as interim president of Venezuela after he illegally swore himself in. We consider the attempted power grab in Venezuela to be a contradiction to and violation of the basics and principles of international law. We are very concerned by the statements that do not rule out some type of intervention from abroad, an intervention by third parties in the ongoing events in Venezuela's internal affairs. We consider such intervention unacceptable, and it may have negative consequences. And we consider any statements about possible use of force to be very dangerous. Speaking at a press conference in Algeria, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov Blame the political instability in Venezuela on grave interference from the West. The fact that the U.S. and a number of other countries, first of all from that region, instantly recognized the new self-proclaimed president speaks about their direct involvement in the orchestrated creation of a dual authority, which brings chaos and a serious political instability. It showed us once again that the U.S., which is paranoid about somebody interfering in their elections, even though they have no proof of that, themselves are trying to do the same. It wasn't the first time they did it during the last months, but in Venezuela, they did it in an extremely rude way. To rule the fates of other people, what they actually do is interfere in their internal affairs. Also, China says it continues to recognize the government of Nicolás Maduro. The foreign ministry called for dialogue to resolve the confrontation in Venezuela. We are highly concerned about the current situation in Venezuela and call on all parties to remain rational and calm and to seek a political solution to the Venezuelan problem through peaceful dialogue within the framework of the Venezuelan constitution. China supports the efforts made by the Venezuelan government to safeguard the sovereignty, independence and stability of the country. What we are worried is with the situation in Venezuela, what we are worried with is the suffering of the Venezuelan people. So many have left the country with the, the economic difficulties that uh, everybody faces and with the political polarization and what we hope is that uh, dialogue can be possible and that we avoid an escalation that could lead to the kind of conflict that would be a total disaster for Venezuela and for the Venezuelan people and for the region. Also, social organizations show their support. In Mexico, many express solidarity towards President Maduro and the people of Venezuela. They also rejected interventionism from the United States and other countries led by the right wing. 
I'm Mexican, and the people of Mexico say we are so close to the U.S. and so far from God. We have lived with interference from the United States, hurting our identity and hurting our territory. Venezuela has more than 20 years of being an example of dignity and what Simón Bolívar presented as a Latin American unity. The Central Committee of the Communist Party in Mexico strongly rejects the imperialist interface of the Trump administration and the OAS against Venezuela's sovereignty. This is clearly coordinated with the reactionary forces. The process to be NACOP started with illegitimate proclamation of Juan Guaidó as president, when President Nicolás Maduro was chosen by the people. Also in Chile, dozens of social, political and cultural leaders went to the Venezuelan embassy to express their support for President Maduro. They were also protecting the diplomatic mission since there were threats of a takeover by opposition members in the country. Some 200 people on motorbikes had arrived at the building and threatened to invade it. Meanwhile, the U.S. has rejected Maduro's decision to break diplomatic ties, claiming the Venezuelan president doesn't have the authority to take such action. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is also refusing to remove staff from the country after Maduro gave the U.S. 72 hours to do so. At the same time, the Trump administration is considering more sanctions against Venezuela that would specifically target the country's oil. All U.S. officials are reportedly considering several measures, including restrictions on U.S. imports of Venezuelan oil or possibly even a full ban. But no final decision has been made. U.S. sanctions already in place have cost Venezuela billions of dollars. On Wednesday, President Nicolás Maduro gave 72 hours for all U.S. diplomatic personnel to leave the country. He accused the U.S. government of trying to divide the Venezuelan people and promoting a coup d'etat. I have decided to break off diplomatic and political relations with the imperialist government of the United States. Out of Venezuela. They can all leave. Enough intervention. We have dignity here. Here there is a people disposed to defend their country. And the government of Nicaragua also expressed its support for the government of President Maduro. In a letter published on social media, the government said, we are all Venezuela. Nicaragua has endured its own threats from the United States, most recently being the target of economic sanctions by the Donald Trump administration. Also, the Palestinian Ministry of Foreign Relations expressed its concerns about U.S. intervention in Venezuela. The state of Palestine said it is grateful for support and solidarity from Venezuela and its president. And support also came from the movement for social justice in Trinidad and Tobago. The movement strongly condemned U.S. interference in Venezuela's internal affairs. We stand fully in solidarity with President Maduro as the legitimately democratically elected president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. We condemn totally the intervention and interference in the internal affairs of Venezuela by the United States government, as evidenced by the statement by Vice President Pence. That must not be allowed to stand. We must stand in solidarity with the people of Venezuela to defend their constitution, to defend their sovereignty, to defend their right to self-determination. Trinidad and Tobago's government says it stands ready to assist Venezuela in any way it can. I too have seen, a, I don't know if it's a tweet or if it's an official position from the United States President, that's his prerogative, he can say whatever he wants. At the end of the day, Venezuela, as far as I'm aware, remains a sovereign country. We stand, as we said throughout, as the Prime Minister said, we stand ready to assist in whatever way we can, including in any mediatory um, position that we may be able to play. But we certainly don't think one government calling on another government to fall is the right way to go about it. St. Lucia, Guyana and Mexico have not joined the rest of the Lima Group in publicly declaring support for Venezuela's opposition leader. It might seem like a strange move for St. Lucia in light of the recent OAS vote. 
However, in an earlier statement, the country's foreign affairs minister reaffirmed St. Lucia's support for Venezuela. We continue to recognize Venezuela as a friend. We have called upon the government to uh, recognize the principles of democracy. And this is not to say that we will not continue to encourage them to do that. The breaking of diplomatic relations is something that is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We are not considering that at all. St. Lucia has had a long historical uh, friendship with Venezuela, and the fact that you call upon a friend to do what is right doesn't mean that you intend to sever the friendship, doesn't mean that you cannot continue to engage in matters of mutual interest. But we're saying to that we do not support the principle of intervention. It's about non-intervention in the affairs, in the domestic affairs of state. All of the declarations we've signed, we've always made it very clear that this is a matter for the people of Venezuela to resolve, and we're calling on the government and opposition to resolve this matter. Our correspondent Hans Eloro has more on the support coming from Russia and other countries to President Maduro. Russia has reaffirmed its support for Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro. This comes after the United States and the country members of the Lima Group recognized the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, as interim president. Russian Senator Andrei Klimov said that his country will not change its political relations with Venezuela. An official statement published by the Foreign Relations Ministry says that the Venezuelan elections were carried out under watch of international observers. On his part, the Vice Minister of Foreign Relations, Sergei Ryabkov, reaffirmed Russia's solidarity with the Latin American country and strongly condemned the U.S. interventionist campaign against President Maduro. He also hopes to continue the intergovernmental trade and economic agreements between both nations. Meanwhile, the Venezuelan opposition also took to the streets in several cities, addressing some of the protesters, Guaido, who was appointed president of the National Assembly just days ago, illegally declared himself interim president. The National Assembly has been in contempt for years and the country's high court ruled their actions are void. And the opposition's move was strongly rejected by those at the Chavista march. We are asking the courts to respond to the big mistake this gentleman is making by declaring himself interim president. No one voted for him. We had elections and the opposition decided not to participate. Why do they want to seize power now? I voted for Maduro. Who voted for Guaido? No one. It's a big mistake what he is doing. The people of Venezuela are marching today in defense of the revolution and democracy and against interventionism. This is a very delicate situation. We are calling on people here to join the national demonstrations and not to respond to these provocations that are being mounted by the right wing in the country and supported by the United States. We, the working people, are against intervention. The people in Venezuela are on alert. And sporadic incidents of violence were reported overnight in Caracas. And tensions remain high between opposition backers and supporters of Maduro's government after a day of large rallies. We'll take a short break now. Don't go away. has always subjugated the masses. But who are the actors behind every move? What are their real interests? We analyze every move on Critical Move Weekdays, only on Telesur.
Welcome back. The Iranian-American journalist Marcier Hashemi has been released from jail in the United States. The press TV host had been in detention for 10 days after being arrested in the U.S. at the St. Louis airport in Missouri. She was considered a material witness in an unnamed case and appeared at least twice before a judge in Washington, D.C. The outgoing president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Joseph Kabila, has called on the Congolese people to support President-elect Felix Tshisekedi. He said Tshisekedi needs everyone's support in order to unite the country and fix the economy. Kabila governed the country since 2001 following his father's assassination. Respecting the Constitution, I will hand over power tomorrow without regrets or remorse because despite the imperfections emanating from all man-made work, Congo has come a long way and rests on a solid foundation today. South Africa prides itself on being the most industrialized country on the African continent, but this doesn't always mean good news for the population. The number of young South Africans suffering from obesity doubled in six years. Matuba Matlaje looks into some of the contributing factors. Research shows that South Africa is going through rapid socio-economic and demographic changes that have triggered a rapid change in eating habits Although Tabiso Matlape blames her obesity on family factors beyond her control. My mother died when I was 12. Um, and my mom was the kind of mother that I am, very loving, very cuddly, very kissy. Um, and when she died, and my dad raised us, as three of us, my dad raised us by himself. And my dad doesn't know how to say I love you. My dad doesn't, he's not a man of words, you know. But the, I think in his trying to prove that he could, he could raise us himself as a man. And you know, this is like 90s South Africa, black men aren't expected to do a lot of things like that. She says she does agree that the country's growing capitalist economy plays a role in changing the lives of its citizens, and she's no exception. There's a new clicks that's just opened on, um, on the freeway. So you literally don't have to go into a shopping center, pack and walk. Right, you can literally park in front of the door and walk two steps into the shop and come out. And I mean, I was very excited because, you know, but eventually I was like, actually, this is not, this is not cute because before I had a car, I was much smaller than this because I walked everywhere. So in between taxis and in between buses, but I was walking. Tabiso is in her early 30s and is also a single mother to a five-year-old. She says she's doing everything she can to break what could be a generational crisis of obesity in her family. Uh, and now she, her, big, her biggest realization of late is that, Mommy, you're fat. Why are you so fat, Mommy? Look, look here, Mommy, look. <gasps> You're so fat, mommy, and and then her friends, and they come, and she doesn't think it's an insult, because she's also a little chubby, you know, and she doesn't know that that's gonna be, you know, that could be her. So we have a lot of fights over food, and um, I'm trying to relax them now. So um, I, I, I buy her juice now, which was things I'd never buy in the house because I've placed my own neurosis um, onto how I was raising her. So it's a bit of a turbulent relationship. Obesity can complicate the mental health of those who suffer from it. And this can be a vicious cycle between the two, leading to fatal diseases. Matiba Mashachi, Telesur in Pretoria. Three planes have landed in Venezuela as part of the government's return to the homeland plan. The flights were commissioned from Ecuador after a wave of xenophobic attacks in the country. Hundreds of Venezuelans disembarked in Caracas with more expected to arrive in the coming months. Recent xenophobic attacks rocked the Venezuelan migrant community in Ecuador. It was particularly toxic in Ibarra, where a Venezuelan citizen killed a woman. To this date, the return to the homeland plan has helped over 9,000 people return home from various Latin American countries. And we heard some of their testimonies before they left Ecuador. The day the tragedy occurred, the xenophobia started. I was attacked by a group of Ecuadorians when I was going back to work. They burned my clothes that were there. Me and some colleagues took refuge in a fruit store and they tried to enter so we had to protect ourselves. And yesterday they returned. Dead sticks, pipes, machetes, and we had to run away. It's been a while since I'm trying to return because we couldn't find a job here. So it's great that the president launched this program. It's very good for us. 
In Brazil, Praia Grande near Sao Paulo has become a popular seaside destination for workers. During the summer season, its population explodes, and so does business for local beach vendors. Alexandre Davido is a school caretaker who is on vacation with his family in a rented beach house. I'm making some snacks to bring to the beach, frying some shrimp and some chicken. I'm going to fry up some sausage too. After the 2016 parliamentary coup against Dilma Rousseff, the Brazilian government made it easier for employers to deny paid vacation to their workers. As a result, more people are vacationing closer to home this year, taking the bus instead of flying. For most of the year, Praia Grande has a population of 300,000, but in summer it swells to over 1 million. Its proximity to Sao Paulo and low prices have made it Brazil's fourth most popular vacation destination, and this year business is booming for the beach vendors. This year things are a lot better. Last year the national crisis hurt us a lot. It may not be the nation's most beautiful beach, but it's clean and its gentle waves make it relatively safe for children. Things might not be looking so bright for Brazil politically at the moment, but a sunny day on the beach with loved ones offers a chance for working class Brazilians like Alexandre to forget about their problems and enjoy the best things that life has to offer. I like Praia Grande because it's close to Sao Paulo. We can bring whatever we want to the beach, the prices are low, and we can have fun somewhere nearby and inexpensive. Brian Mir, Telesur, Praia Grande. We'll be back after this short break with more news. Telesur brings you special interviews with social and political personalities. Monday, from Washington. Tuesday, from Mexico. Wednesday, from Caracas. Thursday, from Quito. Friday, from Havana. Analysis about our continent's reality. Weekdays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. Opposition leader Felix Tshisekedi has been sworn in as president of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The inauguration took place at the Palace of the Nation in Kinshasa. Tshisekedi takes over the helm from Joseph Kabila. He ruled the country for 18 years, succeeding his father, Laurent Desire Kabila, who was assassinated in 2001. Zimbabwe's Human Rights Commission has accused security forces of systematic torture following last week's violent protest over a large fuel price hike. The commission says residents also reported indiscriminate shootings and severe beatings by armed soldiers. President Emerson Enangagwa called the violence unacceptable. And, and witnesses who spoke to the Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission highlighted that Armed soldiers and police visited their homes starting in the evening of Monday, 14 January 2019. They reported a heavy crackdown characterized by indiscriminate and severe beatings. The Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission also made home visits to some of those who were assaulted by the police and soldiers. It was reported that their modus operandi was the same in all the communities assessed by the commission. They would arrive at people's houses at night or in the early hours of the day and ask all men to go outside and lie on the ground. Nigeria's leading female presidential candidate has withdrawn from the upcoming election. 
55-year-old Obi Eseguasili says she decided to drop out after extensive consultations with various leaders from across the country. She is now focusing on helping to build a coalition. General elections will be held in Nigeria on February 16. South African prosecutors have temporarily set aside prosecution of Dudu San Suma. The prosecutors say they are waiting for a key witness testifying in the corruption probe. Dudusan is son to former President Jacob Zuma. He is linked to a major bribery scandal linked to the Gupta family, who are accused of using their friendship with Zuma to control state businesses. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov held a brief meeting with his Algerian counterpart in Algiers on Thursday. Lavrov arrived in the Algerian capital late on Wednesday evening. During his official visit, Russia's top diplomat is scheduled to hold talks with the Algerian Prime Minister about strengthening cooperation between the two countries and to address the crisis in Libya and Syria. And we'll leave you with some live images of the governors of Venezuela who are speaking now and they're supporting President Nicolás Maduro after the events on Wednesday. Y las bases de nuestra república, hoy amenazada por bastardos intereses imperiales. And with that, we come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, you can find us on Starsat Channel 461 in South Africa and 539 in Nigeria, and we're on social media as well. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.